Thank you, everybody, for braving the elements, and thank you especially to Crystal for um, making all the effort. She has family here, so that certainly helps, but at the same time, she has made room in her very busy schedule to come speak to us. And um, because January's program is sponsored by the Friends of the Portsmouth Public Library, I'm going to introduce Glenn Tinsley, and she just has a couple of words to say. Thank you, Sue. Uh, I just wanted to second thank you so much for braving the ice and the cold, and we are sure you will be equally as successful in returning afterwards. <laughs> yes. You will be all warmed up by the magnificence <laughs> of, of, you know, of Ms. Williams' uh, presentation because music is such a lovely universal language, and, and we spend our days in our murmurings and our chats and our electronic communications but to have someone that can tell a story with their voice is just nothing short of a, a, a miracle for us so the friends are just really uh, so appreciative of the opportunity to continue to participate in this series and uh, boy getting getting up mezzo soprano in, in in with the mix is just Oh, lovely. Um, <laughs> thank y'all again for coming. We do have membership information. Uh, actually, most people in this room are members, and uh, you will be receiving your annual howdy letter soon, and uh, don't forget us. But I did bring these in case you wanted to leave something now, but we'll be doing that soon. But again, thank you, and welcome back. Thank you. Of course, so glad you don't forget us. Of course. Thank you again, Ms. Williams, Ms. Burton. Thank you, Ms. Tinsley. Well, I had a plethora of information to um, introduce Ms. Crystal Williams, but I'm only going to highlight a few things because I know really this is kind of her personal journey that she's going to tell us about. So you all know she was born in Portsmouth, she went to IC Norcom, she went to the governor's school and she said that she had always sung, but in the governor's school she kind of found her voice and figured out how she wanted to use it. Because initially she thought she was going to be a teacher of English or language or even secondarily maybe be a counselor in a middle school. I got this off of one of your interviews. <laughs> It may have been a little while ago. Mm -hmm. But anyway, she does believe that teachers encourage educational growth, self-esteem, self-confidence, and pass on a thirst for knowledge and freedom to question and explore. She has a ton of accolades. If you look at her website and any other links under her name, you will see lots and lots of awards that she's been given. She's going to be in Sarasota, I understand, in April at some point in time, or was that last year? Uh, no, that was two years ago. Two years ago. <laughs> anyway, uh, she was a winner of Astral's 2014 National Auditions, and 2013-2014 she created the role of Yvette in the world premiere of Eric Sawyer's The Garden of Martyrs. Um, she appeared as a soloist in Elgar C. Pictures with the Philadelphia Youth Orchestra, Verdi's Requiem with the University of Pennsylvania Symphony Orchestra, and Rossini's Stabat Mater with the New Jersey Master Chorale. She's the first prize and Audience Choice Award winner at the 2014 Wilhelm Stenhammer International Music Competition. Uh, she is a graduate of the Academy of Vocal Arts where she earned an artist diploma in opera performance. She holds a master's of music degree in opera performance from the Yale School of Music and a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in voice performance from Car Carnegie Mellon <laughs> University. And she has founded a scholarship to help all younger artists who need a little assistance along the way. So that's another way to contribute to her that would make her very happy. Yes. And we welcome Ms. Crystal Williams. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Burton. Thank you all again for coming. It's wonderful to be back home. It's, this brings back so many memories being in this library. <laughs> 
I mean, I probably spent most of my youth in here on the computers and the, you know, the children's room down the stairs and just running around. And so it's kind of fitting to be back here. But wow, it's it's been a journey. I always say it takes a village to raise a child. I believe that's very true. And it's been an incredible journey, a blessed a blessed journey. And. I am most fortunate to be here. I am from Portsmouth, Virginia, born and reared in good old P-Town. I am the youngest of five children. I grew up with uh, three sisters and a brother. Uh, my one sister and one brother have since passed away, uh, along with my mother in 2011. So along with that in the mix, it's just been exceptional how much help and support that the community and family and friends and my church families, they have all all helped me to be where I am today. And my family, they've they've just been I mean, you have no idea. I could not be here without them. So I would just like to first and, and say thank you to my family, my friends, all of the people who support me. Dr. Knight knows, I mean, the schools teachers all I mean it's been a journey so from the beginning like I said I'm the youngest of five and I didn't necessarily want to be a singer it wasn't my I want to be in the starlight you know and ah I wasn't doing that in the house <laughs> I love to read and I love school I still love school I make my own school and study you know it's the life of an artist we're always trying to become better and to to reach our full potential and then if you think you've reached that you just oh I can be better so <laughs> so that's that's my love of school and I, I said I would I wanted to be a teacher because children spend more time in school than they do at home functionally, if you think about it. So those creative years, those formative years, they're spent with someone outside of the home. So I thought, well, I could be a teacher and help form them, help, help them be critical thinkers and be productive citizens of the world. And I thought I could be a counselor to help children when they become in middle school, when they get to middle school, because you have pubescent years, prepubescent, and you have all these changes, a lot of issues formed there. So I thought I could be a counselor and help them through that phase of their lives. Always my goal has been to help people. And I've always loved doing that. I'm, I'm very much to myself, but in, in the vein of my mother, she would she could have no money, she could have lots of money, she could be driving and rushing, and she, someone needs a ride. She pulls over and she gives them a ride. They could need some money. Okay, well, I don't have any, but this is what I can do. I can go and make this and sell it and give you the money from this. And then you can have some money, and then I'll keep selling so we can have some money. That's just how she, you know, how she was. So that's how I grew up. I, I grew up seeing that kind of attitude. My dad always said, where there's a will, there, or my mom always said, where there's a will, there's a way. And my dad always said, if you're not going to do it well, don't do it at all. So you can combine those two. It was a very vigorous household. Uh, if you didn't bring home A's, it was a shock, you know, not any of this, you know, I got a C, oh, that's great. No, that was not great. So, but it was fine for me. I loved school. So uh, I grew up in that kind of environment, and I didn't get the musical bug, I guess, professionally until I went to high school. At my seventh grade year, I attended the sample program of the Governor's School for the Arts. They came to Portsmouth, touring the local cities, and Alan Fisher and Robert Brown uh, they were the directors, and or that Alan Fisher is the head, and I think Robert Brown was, uh, I don't know if they coach here, I can't remember now, but um, they had a sample program, and I remember listening to Robert Brown's back, and it was vibrating. You know, he was singing Carmen or something, and I just thought, that's amazing. What is this sound vibrating out of this body? You know, I mean, I grew up with music, of course, but just never, I never felt someone vibrating, you know, I never felt that kind of experience musically. So. I, I asked the director, I said, you know, what is this program about? And I got a feel for it. And he said, you know, this is what we do. It's a four-year program. And you come here after your main high school. And we have productions and et cetera, et cetera. So in, in, in short, he said, if you audition, you'll get in. So I had to learn Voice Sapete and Aria from Le Nozzi di Figaro by Mozart. 
And to this day, probably my whole entire family knows that aria because I went and memorized and memorized and memorized and sang it over and over and over again. So I got in, and my freshman year, we took a trip to New York City, and we went to the Tower Records. And I remember standing there watching Leontine Price sing something. I have no idea what it was. But I remember being glued to the floor. I did not move. And I just stood there watching her and listening and feeling. And I just thought, this is incredible. And that was kind of a, not a breaking point, but at that point I was thinking about being a biology major. I wanted to cure cancer or some you know, major disease. I wanted to help people, you know, make a change, positive change, impact in the world. So I asked the director, Alan Fisher, I said, how can music help people? I mean, because I can be really realistic, you know. I mean, you're singing a song. How is a song going to help somebody? And he said, you can help them through the music. And that is what I have been trying to do ever since. My mom would always have me sing and sing for her friends. And now I realize she was asking me to sing because it was making her feel better. She was asking me to sing for her friends because it was making them feel better. And there is power in music. There, I went on to college and, you know, these lofty ideas and took a musical uh, an anal analysis and appreciation course. And there are all types of music, sensory. I mean, they have all these labels and they do all sorts of things. So scientifically, it's proven that music does help people. And so, you know, that kind of just made me feel a little bit more at peace with myself. But it's, that's, that's been my journey to, to help people through the music. And I got into Carnegie Mellon. My dream school was actually Juilliard. I was heartbroken when I didn't get in, heartbroken. I applied to, I don't know, seven schools. And I didn't get in. And it was just the right fit because I'm a bit brainy, but I love music, so it was, I mean, I worked the most I've ever worked in my life at Carnegie Mellon, but it was worth it. Uh, and so that was a good fit for me. I met Suzanne Marcy, who's like my second mom. She's my musical mother. And she taught me so much, not only in music, but how to approach projects and, and deal with people in the business. So it, everything I say happens for a reason. And that was my blessing to not have gotten into Juilliard. Uh, I then went on to Yale and then the Academy of Vocal Arts and where I met amazing coaches. Uh, Laurent Philippe is one of my top coaches right now and along with the other coaches at AVA and it's, I mean, they break you down, but I, as I told them my first year, I said, you can break me down, but you will put me back together before I leave here. So it's, it, it was a wonderful, wonderful challenge an extreme challenge just to it just open my eyes very wide as to what I did know and what I did not know, uh, what I needed to work on and just strengthen me as a person. You know, you get to a point where you, know, you sing for so many people and this is a very subjective business. Uh, you have to be okay with where you are and who you are. We're not perfect. And on any given day, you can sound any kind of way. And I, I, I learned to say, this is how I sound. And if you don't like, that sound, that's okay. Because I have something to say and somebody does want to hear it. So as long as the good Lord tells me to keep singing and keep sharing, I will continue to share. So thank you, as they always tell the auditionees, thank you. So I say, thank you. <laughs> and I walk out the door. But it's, you know, that's something you learn. If they always say, if you can't say no, or if you can't take no as a, as a response or after you sing and all they say is, mm, yeah, but if you could do this, it's not a business for you. So you, you have to have a lot of strength and courage and willpower, discipline, and all of those things go back to my upbringing in Portsmouth. You go through so much, you know, my mom always said we're too rich to be poor and too poor to be rich. So you have that sort of work, hard work ethic and, you know, just pull those boots up and let's go, okay? Uh, that's how my scholarship got started. I went to high school and then I went to wanted to attend college, but to attend college you have to apply. And those college applications were hundreds of dollars that we did not have. So I went to my mom and I said, Mom, I'm studying. I have a four plus GPA. There are no scholarships for musicians. It's always science, biology, math, this, that, nursing. What should I do? Make your own. So in 2004, I founded the Chris Lee Williams Scholarship and I was the first recipient. <laughs> and I took myself and I went on to college. And then the next year, I, I came back and I gave it to someone else. 
but it goes to a graduating senior pursuing a career in the performing arts. And that's what we have to do. That's, that's what I've garnered from my upbringing, that it doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter your family. It doesn't matter your, your background. It doesn't matter the circumstances. You can make a way. Like my mom said, where there's a will, there is a way. And if you have the will, then find the way. God will provide the way. And that's, that's seriously what I believe. That's what I do with the, co the, scholar, uh, the scholarship. And then when I wanted to study abroad, I gave recitals in Pittsburgh, in Connecticut, in Philadelphia, wherever I could give a, a concert, whatever I could do to, to help myself, that's what I did. And that helped me get through school. That helped me just to, to inspire other people. People come to me now and say, Crystal, I'm trying to do this. How do you do these recitals? How do you just up and do a concert? You just up and do it. <laughs> I mean, you just put it together. You have to, of course, call and type people. But that's a part of, of that mindset. And that's what I'm, I'm most grateful for, from my family, from my community. And something that I wish to see more of in my community is I have been immensely supported. But even still, where is the support? I give a concert every year. It's free. I don't slag off and just say, I'll sing this. I, if anything, I put more into this recital, this concert, because I want my community, my people to know that I appreciate and respect them, that I believe that they deserve the highest caliber of art. And that is what I want my community, my town, my city to be known for. And I want people to feel free to come out. It's not an esoteric field. Music is universal. Everybody can come and feel welcome. There's no uh, you know, fee. There's no dress code. I mean, of course, I am a performer, so please. But you know, if you have what you have, wear that. Come as you are. That's my mentality. It's just to share the art and the music. And for me, coming back to Portsmouth every year, I just want young artists from the area to know that there are people who support you. And, and wherever you are in your journey, don't give up. Don't see the lack of support or the lack of, uh, of co people coming out to your, uh, to your engagements as, as, a, as you are not worth this effort. You're not worth having your dream realized. I want them to realize that, to know that people can make it from here. People, people have amazing talent from Portsmouth. And a lot of times they, they simply aren't realized. People give up, people lose hope, they just lose their, their joy of whatever it is they do. And I, I want people to know that it's still alive and popping, as they say, in Portsmouth. I mean, I want Portsmouth to be known for arts. I don't want it to be known for all this other stuff. I want it to be a positive place where people can come and say, oh, there's a beautiful you know, recital. There's an there's art gallery. There's a museum. There, you know, that's what I want people to know about my town. People say, where are you from? Portsmouth, Virginia. And I love it. That's where I'm from. This is where I'm from. And I want people to not be ashamed of where they're from, to, to, to have joy when they say Portsmouth. As they say, put it on the map. It's on the map. Now people come on, <laughs> you know? So I, that's my journey in a nutshell. But if you have any questions, we can kind of feed in and out, weave in and out. Feel free. Yes? I've just recently seen Florence Foster. Mm -hmm. um, she had a pianist that was with her all the time. Mm -hmm. she, when she studied and when she was on stage. Do you have one pianist that is with you most of the time, someone you really trust to be there? I don't have one that's there all the time, but I do have um, a kind of a pocket of people that I, I go to for performances or for recitals or for my own coaches and voice lessons, I do. I have my own voice teacher and I have my, my kind of group of coaches and we call them ears, people that I trust with my my, my instrument and my voice. Um, but as far as a performance pianist, I would love to, to build a rapport like that. I mean, I, I've been performing with Oksana here in the, in the area for, gosh, I don't even know how many years now, Oksana Lutzishian. So in a in sense, she would be my, the pianist here in this area. 
but one that travels with me everywhere. No, it's kind of different um, than it used to be. The opera singers used to have a house. There would be house singers, like I sing at the Metropolitan Opera, I sing at La Scala, I sing at the Wiener Staatsoper. And now it's you go by contract. So you travel here, you travel there, you own, you're not only at one house. And it's the same for pianists. I mean, probably the top, top artists have someone like that, you know, someone who can travel with them. and. Uh, or someone that, if they have a recital, this is my pianist. Um, but nowadays, it's a bit more varied in, in the collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yes? Where do you see yourself in the future, vis-a-vis -vis your, your uh, career? In the future, how far? <laughs> as far as you would like to think. Well, as far as I would like to think, I will have sung on all of the greatest stages with all of the greatest <laughs> artists in the world, collaborating on all of the greatest music in the world, perhaps writing my own music. Um, I, will, I see myself uh, having grown my scholarship. My goal is to have it broaden into a week of um, audition kind of experience, uh, essay writing, resume proofing, presentation, kind of the whole package along with the scholarship. Because my original goal was to help students get to college, which means application fees. So I'd love to have a grant established specifically for application fees. So you apply, uh, you submit your material, some resume or some recommendations and some essays, and then you're given money to help you apply to school. But then also the scholarship that helps you through school. And I would love to develop it so that I could be a yearly scholarship, so that I can help them each year instead of only the first year. Um, and I would love to just be able to help more people, which is that week-long program could be to help them with audition materials. It could be to help them with how you walk into a room, how you present yourself, how your resume looks on, the, on paper, um, just things that help you get into your art form. So like a performance camp. Yes, or an audition, audition, more an audition type program. Mm -hmm. so preparation, other, I guess, audition other than preparation. The of the scholarship, um, do you have any other interface with the, the students that you are helping? Yes, some, I write some of them and just keep up with where they are. A lot of times we're in the same cities, so if I can, I try to go and see them perform. Um, what I would also love to do is have a year where I have some of the previous winners, or recipients rather, come back and perform as I did the second year. But So well, lots of ideas. Yep. So how do you learn the languages for each one of the various operas, the Italian, the German? Spanish? Uh, well, when I was in school, I took Italian, German, French. Uh, I took Russian diction, uh, as well as Czech, I believe. So you, you study the languages. I, I studied, and then I also studied abroad for Italian and German. And I studied uh, with an, through an immersion course French. So you learn the language. And if not learn the language fluently or as, you know, conversationally, you learn your role. So you have to translate. It takes time. You memorize. But you have to make it so that second nature in, in your mind so that it clearly communicates to an audience. Mm -hmm. But it takes time. A lot of people think singing is just open your mouth and sing. It's, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of hard work. I mean, memorization, research, history, Money going into coaches and voice lessons, the time it takes to translate, to memorize, to actually learn the notes, to, to become one with your poetry and your text. Uh, there's, it's a lot of hard work. And actually, someone did a study, I saw it on Facebook or somewhere, where they analyzed all the parts of the brain during, uh, it was for piano, while you're playing. So I would love to see what that looks like while you're performing as a, as a uh, singer. When you're on stage, all of the parts of your of your brain that are working, it's it's amazing to me, very fascinating. Mm -hmm. Favorite opera or composer? Oh, or opera? can I only choose one? <laughs> I have a lot. I love Rossini, Il Barbiere di Siviglia, The Barber of Seville, Rosina. I mean, that's I love. Out of the roles that I've performed, I would probably say Rosina. Uh, but I also love Massenet. I love Carmen, I love the, the Bel Canto, Donizetti, Bellini. But out of the roles that I've actually performed, 
my f most favorite at the moment would be Rosina, the Barber of Seville. Yes. What have you got coming up this year? Well, on Thursday, I'm dashing out of here and I'm going to rehearsal for a recital in Philly at the Curtis Institute presented by the Philadelphia Orchestra. And then I have, uh, what else? I have another concert coming up in Baltimore. I have concerts in Massachusetts, I think one in Maine. Um, I have, I'm going back to uh, England, I'm going to London for Charlie Parker's Yardbird. Um, so um, auditions, yeah, the, yes. My daughter's um, brother-in-law, Jason Powell, asked that I give you his regards. Oh. He performed with you in DC. Mm -hmm. And my daughter and grandkids had an opportunity to go to that performance as well. Wonderful. He said that they enjoyed it immensely. Thank you. So I just want to let you know, he told me to make sure I could give you his regards. Thank so, you, um, thank you. When you were here in Portsmouth, um, I mean, I, I know a lot of opera because I had to catalog records <laughs> the whole time. But I'm, you know, I'm not any kind of a student. But you also sang Kirschwein. Yes. Like one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, do you do other composers besides operatic composers besides Gershwin? Well, I sing what I can sing best <laughs> and what I enjoy, uh, if at all possible. Hymns, you sang I love hymns, hymns yes, yeah. uh, spirituals. Uh, but I, I do, I used to, it's a growing, a growing love. Mm -hmm. Because when I was in school, I thought, oh, musical theater, because I, I'm not really a fan of the off the breath singing and all that, but legit musical theater I love. Ragtime, um, court viol, uh, composers like that, I love, I love the music and I love listening to it, but as far as performing for myself, I do love some musical theater um, and some, some jazz numbers even, mm -hmm. um, but my main uh, focus or specialty is opera, but I do, I do dabble here and there. Well, I thought your voice lent itself very well to the Gershwin pieces mm -hmm. that chose. I mean, it's yes. also one of my favorites. Thank you. Well, I also love new music, too, so I like singing new music. Mm-hmm. Yep. Any other questions? Where do you live? I currently live in Northern Virginia. Okay. Mm-hmm. But when you go to um, auditions, are they mostly in, uh, in... Most auditions are in New York, but when I sang for the Birmingham Opera Company with Graham Vick, uh, that was 2014. They flew me to, to England, so it just depends on the company. So I mean, so if they want you, it just, if they think you're a top contender, they will actually pay your way to audition sometimes? Yes, that's how it used to be, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but, oh no, actually it used to be that they would go and hear you live. They would go to some performance you had, who the casting director or whoever wanted to hear you. But they will fly you if they want to hear you, or most of them are in New York, though. You just go to New York and all of them are there. Everybody goes to New York. So at some point, Everyone's in New York. Mm -hmm. Yes? You, uh, did you say you have a voice coach? Yes, I have a, a couple. <laughs> a couple. What would you say is the best advice that they have given to you over, over the theory of time if you had a voice coach? I mean, well. I can't carry a tune in a bucket, but... <laughs> Well, the best advice that I've received from my vocal coaches, well, it just depends. I've received key information at various stages of my education, I would say. Uh, Joe Walsh always gives me, you know, musical advice as far as, you know, approaching song <laughs> as an opera, which I always love because I love both. But in opera, he, well, the bel canto style and different... Uh, yeah, I would say bel canto, you have a little bit more um, leeway as far as the vocalism and giving and taking to and, and singing through the lines. And in song, we often think of trying to fit it into a little box and kind of be formed like this. But he kind of gave me the idea to expand as you do an opera in art song or in any type of music, no matter whenever I open my mouth. And one of my fa favorite pieces of advice uh, 
through the years has been from Laurent Philippe. Uh, he's great, but my first coaching with him, he told me my voice, I sounded like trash, not fit to be recycled. And oh. Oh. yes, yes. And, and then he told me one time, well, Miss Williams, you know, it's a bit rough, but sometimes there are some bits of gold in there. So, <laughs> so open it up, open it up. <laughs> so I always think, open it up, mezzo. So that, that's, you know, some of my favorite tidbits. It's, but it's, it's all in the, in the wash. You know, I, I was offended at first, but then I thought, well, if, if I sound like trash now, then what will I sound like in four years? Because this is the same one that I told, if you're going to tear me down, you're going to pull me back together. Yeah. yeah. And now we're great friends, and I still work with him. So <laughs> it, it ended well. <laughs> yeah. Help put you back together. Yeah. Yes. Well, while we talk about publicity, I will speak up on that. Please. I and One on One Club, who sponsors the An Evening with Chris Williams concert and helps with the scholarship, we have been trying for years, and I repeat, years, to publicize, get the word out, just let people know. And I have no idea. Every year we, we come back and powwow, and we will continue to powwow, because in this area, we specifically want people to know there is art, there is quality art, there are opportunities for you here, come. And we tried giving flyers early. We've tried giving flyers late. We've tried newspapers, writing people. We've tried to contact the newspapers. We've tried to contact Virginian Pilot, Journal, New Journal Guide, all kinds of everything. We've tried. We've tried doing, putting ads or whatever we can do. And what, but, time, of, what time of the year? It's always in the summer, usually always June. Mm-hmm. Well, let us know. I have flyers right okay, there. Good. Okay. <laughs> we always in yes. yes. Always in the and it's in the currents, yeah. yes. Yeah. But people always say, oh, it's early. It was, yeah. If I had heard about it. Oh, no, if I should have been reminded about it. My thing is, if, if it's a concert that you wanted to attend, like Beyonce or something else, mm -hmm. or the latest sale or, you know, pair of shoes, you'd be there. You wouldn't need a reminder. And that, for me, goes along with the, the exposure and the publicity. To me, it's societal. How are we presenting art versus material things versus, this is a part of our culture, you know? So how, how are we prioritizing or ranking that in the exposure, in the publicity? You know, we're, we're saying it's okay to, to talk about the shoes but not listen to it or seeing you too loud. You know, and thank God your parents knew to just let you be, yes. you know, because the world would be without Dr. Knight, as we know. And you know, and it starts with education, okay, and, and whether it's through the home or the school system mm -hmm. or society, society in, in general, mm -hmm. and exposure. Yes. You know, and I believe that, that uh, we have the inertia here to make the difference. Yes. Um, we just politics, have... of course, supersede. Mm -hmm. Okay, in terms of the basics when it comes to knowledgeable contracts. So, so um, I'm glad that you brought that up. Glad you made mention of the fact that I'm not being aware, because even even in the media, the assumption is that people read the paper every week, every day. And in this area, you know, it's oh my goodness, you know, it's some of the not even aware that it's snowed already. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? so so we're gonna work on that. Mm -hmm. okay. But like you say, I mean, that's, I, I have hope for, for my city and for the area. And we just have to figure out. And like, I, I remember inviting someone to a concert a couple years ago. And he said, oh, you know, what kind of music is it? I said, opera. He said, oh, no, no. I said, well, excuse me, but have you ever attended an opera? Have you ever attended a classical recital? No. And so for me, I said, well, should I be offended? Is it because of me? Or is it because of your perception of classical music? You've never attended. How can you knowledgeably say whether or not you like something? And that, that is why I give the free concert every year. Just go. Be exposed. It might, you might like it. If you don't, that's fine. I have people in my family who go to support me, but they don't necessarily like opera. I am fine with that. It's an appreciation of the artist and of the art form. Like any 
other genre where you work hard, you just appreciate that, pers that person for their hard work and acknowledge that it's something that's nice, it's a piece of art, or I can acknowledge a beautiful pair of shoes. Those are fabulous. I won't spend that much for them, but those are fabulous. It's an appreciation. And that's, for me as a performing artist, that's what I want to see from my town. Oh, Crystal, that's great, we love it, oh, we're coming. Okay, but what you're showing, not only to me, is that other young performing artists of the area, nobody will support me, nobody appreciates if I do that. Nobody will come out. Nobody will, will think that that's something worth acknowledging. And that's what hurts me. I, I, are, I can accept no. But what I will not accept is the image and the, 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 the vision that you are destroying of tomorrow's artists. That is what I take offense to. How important was the experience of going to New York that first time you talked about mm -hmm. going? Because I, I think that this is something, after my years and years of working with the school system, that many of our very talented students don't have the opportunity to leave here and, and go see something like a, an amazing artist recording. Mm -hmm. Or how, how key was that to you continuing? I mean, I know you were already at the governor's school at that point, mm -hmm. but going to New York, was that key to having you continue to pursue music as well I mean you could probably argue that that was a a turning point because I like I said I was you know I'm going to be a biologist my <clears throat> excuse me one sister uh, was majoring in physics one was in chemistry and material science and I was going to be the biologist and we were going to just rock this world <laughs> uh, and I <laughs> took a turn and Started so helping in a different way. <clears throat> yes. Students is as important as. Well, for me, that's a part of education. I mean, that's why I wanted to be a teacher because as a teacher, you have the power, you have the impact, and the great influence to positively <laughs> affect change in tomorrow's world, whether or not you see it today. And that being said, as a teacher, you can fight for these field trips. You can fight for all kinds of grants and such. But even if you don't get those, you have the power to bring that to them. Maybe if I hadn't gone, I could have had that moment in listening to a recording at the governor's school in Norfolk. I don't know. I don't know if it would have had the same impact. And as educators, the arts is a part of education. I believe that life is a part of education. It's not simply standardized tests, which is a whole nother issue. But with that being said, you have to learn how to live, if that makes sense. Learn how to question. Learn how to be inquisitive and explore. I don't know what happened to that. That's a part of the arts, and maybe that's now lacking funding or something. I don't know. But we used to go outside and dig in the dirt, bring, build, make, create, grow, take field trips. You know, I remember going to, and this, is, this will tell you, I took a trip to Jamestown, and then at some point I took a trip to Philadelphia. And I can't remember, I, in my mind, the two blur and mix, but I have that image in my head of traveling to another place, another city outside of my own bubble, and experiencing history. That's just another way to learn history. You can't force someone to learn a certain way. Some people have to feel it, smell it, see it, taste it, read it. These are all of our senses. And this is maybe me speaking as an artist, but going, take, first getting the money. Because again, appreciating what it takes to, to experience live art or any kind of art or any kind of culture. And then to get on that trip, that bus, and for me, that was the longest trip I had taken away from my family, you know, as a 13, 14 year old. And, and to be there, to experience living with these other people that I went to school with, but I never stayed in a hotel with these strange people. You know, they're my friends, but in that sense, it's a bit strange, no? 
And so that's also a part of learning, a part of learning how to cohabitate, how to live with people who are different from you, how to empathize and sympathize with people of different backgrounds than you. I mean, to me, that is education. And so how impactful was that? Immensely. As someone from Portsmouth, I want the culture and the life of my city to stay alive, the soul to live. And we have to come together as a community because it takes a village. So let's make our village and figure out a way to resolve these issues that's keeping us as a city, as a people from reaching our full potential, our full potential. Because it's great, it's full of diamonds and gems and mm -hmm. We're just throwing them away like they're pebbles and rocks. Does anybody else have any questions for Crystal? I did kind of want to know what was your favorite city that you <coughs> haven't been able to visit over the Well, Europe. I will say the first time I went to Birmingham, England, I felt right at home. I didn't feel lost <laughs> or as if I couldn't be understood or anything like that. I also was Paris, but I would say Birmingham was the first place that I visited and just thought, okay, I'm walking down the street. Mm -hmm. I know where I'm going. I didn't know where I was going, but you know, I, did, I just felt right at home. Interesting. Yeah. Well, and to kind of connect with what we've been discussing today, in March, we are gonna have Dr. Ellie Bracey and uh, Claude Parent of the school board here mm -hmm. to talk about all the things that are good about the yes, school system. Good. And that in between, in February, we have a doctor, Dr. Greg, Douglas Gregory, that uh, Ms. Mizell had heard and has introduced us to, who's going to talk about concussions. Mm. And this has become a very big mm. issue from um, middle school way on up to pro ball. And I think that we can hopefully get some good information and some discussion going about that. Yes. And kind of back to the second Tuesday forum, just so I mean, you all have not been before. I mean, we try to cover a wide variety of topics. Every year we have five programs, and we just want to introduce, and a lot of them are locally based by local people about local issues and local things that are going on mm -hmm. that we need to be aware of, or even regional. Like the midwives program was excellent. Yes, was, it yes. was excellent. I need to text that was to excellent. see how she yes. was. But mm -hmm. I mean, it is. We, we try to mix it up so we have various <laughs> things coming in. And I was fortunate enough, of course, Ida K. Jordan, your biggest yes. and support. Oh, I yeah, I'm know. Sure because of the weather. She was the snow, really yes. Really difficult. And she has pushed for a long time. Yes, she years. She <laughs> Ms. Williams all the support and accolades that yes. she deserves. And so she's here in her heart. Yes. But and I love to leave on a positive note. Please. Yes. So all of the good things of Portsmouth, it's a wonderful city. It's my city. It's our city. And I would love to leave you all with some flyers about the Crystal Lee Williams Scholarship, as well as an evening with Crystal Lee, which is coming up in its 14th year in the summer of 2017. So let's all be positive. Please share. Put on our thinking caps. Go get it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.